So uh, Tom will uh, start his lecture right now. Uh, let me introduce our speaker, Tom. So Tom and I go back uh, quite a while ago. We are both uh, graduate students from the same department from the University of Washington. Uh, we actually have the same advisor. Um, and so uh, Tom and I uh, sort of got interested in integrable systems around about, I would say, roughly the same time. Uh, after his PhD, Tom went to uh, New York uh, University and worked with Percy Daft as a postdoc, uh, where he did a lot more work on uh, probability theory and integrable systems. And uh, I have to also mention that Tom is a uh, probably the world's leading expert, uh, if not one of the leading experts on the numerical uh, computation of uh, Riemann-Hilbert problems. So I hope to have a very interesting and engaging series of lectures from Tom. So thanks. So thanks, Vishal, and thanks for the invitation. I'm very impressed with the Institute and this amazing opportunity to come to Bangalore. Um, so let's see here. So I'll give you first an outline of the four lectures. Um, and then, you know, so I know many in the audience may or may not be familiar with Riemann-Hilbert problems. So I'll try to motivate the, uh, a very simple or one of the simplest Riemann-Hilbert problems from just some special function theory. Um, okay. So. of Riemann-Hilbert problems. Okay. So my outline, which I'll first give you, is so the today and probably part of tomorrow, I will be talking about Cauchy integrals and their computation. And so please, at any time, if you have questions or you can't read something, you need me to write li larger, please let me know. Um, so, right, so this is, you know, it's kind of a fundamental numerical complex analysis topic. It's a computation of singular integrals, and, you know, so what numerical methods can we come up with but also, to really do that right, we have to spend kind of quite a bit of time thinking about the theory of Cauchy integrals and curves and kind of treat that right. And then it'll make all of the future developments much easier. Okay. So then, so the second thing I will talk about is once I have the theory of Cauchy integrals in hand, I can define properly and discuss Riemann-Hilbert problems, or what I mean by Riemann-Hilbert problems. Okay. And once I pose a Riemann-Hilbert problem, we'll see the interplay between Cauchy integrals and Riemann-Hilbert problems. To solve these, we'll actually have to talk about discretizing operator equations. So what you'll see is so a Riemann-Hilbert problem, loosely speaking, is a boundary value problem in the complex plane. And so you have an analytic function that has some sort of a jump condition, so it's sectionally analytic, and it has a jump condition across some curve. And the, the point I want to get across, the biggest thing is Riemann-Hilbert problems lead in a natural way to singular integral equations. And I will pose my Riemann-Hilbert problems in such a way that they will always be equivalent to integral equations. So when, once I write down what a Riemann-Hilbert problem is, we'll see exactly how you go between the two. And so, yeah, these boundaries, it's, it's really the analogous thing you would do in say, for harmonic function theory, doing some sort of boundary integral. And then I'll spend some time talking about applications. 
And these will mainly consist of something that you'll see right away, which is special functions. Right. Um, we'll also talk about nonlinear special functions. We'll see how much time I have for this. Um, this would be something like pan levé functions. Okay, so this is something I probably won't emphasize too much, but it's certainly out there, and we can talk about it more in some of the discussion sections. And then, so I'll focus mainly on A and C, so this is integral systems. Right, and so I should kind of point out that how this goes is so your Cauchy integrals, this has wide applicability. And so Riemann-Hilbert problems use the theory of Cauchy integrals, and so there's somewhat less applicability, but still it extends far beyond these three topics. Right? So like something like Wiener filtering theory, uh, uh, Wiener-Hopf problems fit into this category. Right? And then this also has wide, I mean, the philosophy behind what I'll talk about here extends far beyond just Riemann-Hilbert problems but we need the machinery to discuss everything. Okay. So, the first, I'll talk about a simple Riemann-Hilbert problem. Okay, and this is me. All my notes up here. So I'll talk about the complementary complementary error function. Okay, so what is this guy? So this is ERFC of Z, and it's defined as root 2 pi. We have an integral from z to plus infinity of e to the uh, minus s squared ds. Okay, and so what do I mean by this? Well, okay, if we're looking in our complex plane and here is z, I'll integrate in along the real axis. Of course, the path doesn't really matter, but just to be concrete about it, I'll integrate in and then integrate up to the point z. So the application I have in mind is I want to be able to compute this. I want to be able to compute this everywhere in the entire complex plane. Right. So our goal is compute, and we won't finish it. By the end of the lectures we will, but not today. Z in all of C with uniform error control. I want to be able to plug in any value of C and have really my relative error to be controlled. It'll be in all of Z, or all of C, yeah. And that's the power of the Riemann-Hilbert theory. Okay, so what I'll do today is pose a Riemann-Hilbert problem for the error function. And so to motivate why one might want to not, you have an explicit integral in front of you, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this integral? Right, so I want to compute it for all possible values of z. So you can think about, well, okay, what if z is very high up on the imaginary axis? We're going to have some growth of this. If we're out somewhere else in the complex plane, large imaginary part, we're also going to have some oscillations from this. So coming into this and then doing this integral could be an oscillatory integral. And it could be difficult, very large integrand. And so what I want to be able to do is pull off the largeness exactly and express the remainder as a nice sectionally analytic function that I can compute. Okay. 
So the first thing we'll do is we'll just look at our integral. And let's, let's integrate it by parts. All right, so then what do I have? I write it as a 2s over s. I need some assumptions on what z is. Let's say the imaginary part, uh, not imaginary part, real part of z is positive, and we'll also assume that the modulus of z is bigger than 1. So really, I'm going to do integration by parts to understand the large z behavior. Okay, so I'll write this. We integrate by parts, and we will get a couple terms. So the first one is integrating that and that. Z to, we just have the evaluation, so we have e to the minus z squared over 2z. And then what we'll have, we'll pick up three minus signs, and we'll have e to the minus s squared over 2s squared, yes. Okay. So then as we send z to infinity, what we expect is this to be our leading order term, and then this will be the next smaller term. Okay. And so let's, let's just kind of do these calculations. You can, you can extend it to the general setting, but let's actually just think about um, z real satisfying these conditions as well. So z is greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1. Just think on the real axis. Just It'll keep things simple. And so now I have this, and I want to understand what go, what's going on there. We have this guy, we have e to the minus s squared over 2s squared ds. And I change variables, I say s is equal to z plus x. So now my integral is 0 to infinity. I plug in this here and I get an e to the minus z squared minus x squared minus 2xz all over to z plus x squared dx. Okay, so now let's estimate this. Okay, and so we want to estimate. I can sense z based on these assumptions. This is, I can pull out this part as a 2z squared. I can pull out this. And then I'm left with this integral to the minus x squared minus 2xz. Okay, but this is, this is even easier to bound because this product is positive, so I just throw away that term, I bound it by this, and I get a nice, I just do the, the half of the Gaussian integral, which gives me, I guess, e to the minus z squared over, right, so if I had an integral minus infinity to infinity, I would get a root pi, but I have half of that. So then I get over four, root pi over z squared. Okay. Right, so all of this is basically a calculation to show ourselves that this is indeed a lower order term. Right, and okay, if z is not real, you have to do a little bit more calculations, but you can see basically a similar estimate where now you just have like that. And really what I want to do is for general z, I take this, I put it inside here, and then I get a bound of that form. Okay. All right. And so that 
gives us an idea what's going on here. So if I take this integral, I multiply it by e to the plus z squared over here, I get something that goes as 1 over z for your imaginary or a real part of z positive off to infinity. Okay. Now we have to think about the real part of z, say, less than 0. What happens over there? And I actually no longer really want to consider this guy because as z goes to minus infinity, of course, this whole thing becomes root, uh, root pi. So let me just put up what you want to consider. This function. Right? Because this guy here, as z goes to minus infinity, I get a root pi. It cancels that. And so this is my constant behavior as z goes to minus infinity. Right? And then once I really subtract off the two, it becomes the same calculation. It really becomes the same calculation. And this is asymptotically 1 over z as z goes to infinity, uh, the real part of z less than 0. Okay. So, we're basically at the point where I can set up a Riemann-Hilbert problem. So now I have a function defined for the real part of z positive, a function defined for the real part of z negative, and now I'll collect that in a function that's analytic everywhere except on the imaginary axis. And it will turn out that it's convenient to write it this way. So minus e to the z squared error function. This is for the real part of z positive. Right? And that's a function which we know goes as 1 over z. And then the other one is this. This is for the real part of z less than 0. Okay, so now I have a sectionally analytic function psi. Yes? Right, yeah, so I used this fact just for, just to understand large z behavior. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Right, that's right. Right, but these are continuous functions in that region, so they're bounded by some constant. Right, but what really, this calculation is, so I'm going to list a bunch of properties for psi, and this calculation is one of those important properties. Right, and so I don't, I already know what happens at z equals zero because everything's analytic. Okay, so... See these razors over. Okay, I'll use that. Okay, All right. So now what I'm going to do is basically use everything that, that we've listed and estimated to put down some properties of psi. So, properties of psi, right? So first is psi is analytic in C, take away the imaginary axis. Uh, 
The second one is psi has continuous boundary values on the imaginary axis from the from the left and right. Right, because everything has an analytic extension through. Okay, the next one which we worked hard at, that, that psi is order one over z uniformly as z goes to infinity. That's very important. And the next thing is so, let me draw a picture. We have our imaginary axis. We have a function on the right and the left. So we think of orientation. So this is the positive side of the curve. That's the negative side. And so then when I write psi plus, so I'm going to write something that is valid on the imaginary axis now. So when I write psi plus, I mean the boundary value of this sectionally defined function from the left. Okay. Psi plus. Okay, so then let's see, what do we have? I go all the way over here to, I have this, size all the way here. If I subtract these two terms, I exactly lose, oh, here's a typo. If I subtract these two terms, I exactly lose the error function. Right? That's the thing that I want to compute. And if I was to write psi plus minus psi minus, that's what I'm going to write. Let me just write that. And if I got something that depended on the error function, I wouldn't have a problem that is independent of the error function. So I need it to cancel out. And so once you do that, you have that. Right, and don't be worried, on the imaginary axis, this decays very nicely. Okay, and this is a Riemann-Hilbert problem for psi. Yes. Right. Yes. Let's see. So, I mean, if you chose it to be something else, like what, what were you choosing it as? Sorry. Right, I mean, so you can do a similar, maybe this helps to answer, you can do a similar calculation, say, for area functions. And then you no longer have just a simple curve, you have Stokes rays that are off in the complex plane, and now you have, like, three different jump con contours that you have to handle. And here, I mean, the, the, yeah, I don't know if that helps. Mm-hmm. No, no, you would actually, in the area case, you would have some sort of, like, to the uh, three halves up here. Right. It, it's coming exactly from that fact. It's coming exactly from that right there. And it's, it's basically because my error function, I, once I take this thing and I multiply it by e to the z squared, that's my leading order behavior, and then that's what appears on this curve. Right? So for, for area functions, you have a different leading order behavior that has some fraction and fractional power in the exponent, and then that's what appears on the jump curve. Right, so, I mean, for this one, I'll, I'll always just choose, I'll come in from plus infinity until I hit the real part of z, and then I'll go up or above or below. Right. I mean, of course, it doesn't matter, but for when you're doing all these integration by part steps, you kind of need to make a choice. Other questions? Yeah.
Yes, so you, you try to take your special function that you don't know how to handle and you try to write it in terms of more elementary functions and how you do that is by those, those element, more elementary functions appear on a jump condition. And so, okay, let's just dwell on this a little bit more. So let's assume just if I just gave you these four conditions, you could first write down a formula for psi, and second, you could easily numerically evaluate that formula. Okay? Those are non-obvious statements. And so assume that I write this down, you're like, oh, sure, here's, here's psi. Here's a, a numerical code to compute psi. Okay? Well, then you go over here. I have this. I can solve for that. And this captures the large behavior and actually gives us nicely controlled relative error. Because when this is large, I'm not computing this. I'm computing this, which is actually a nice bounded thing. This is actually uniformly bounded in the complex plane, and you can compute it uniformly in the complex plane. So you can get error uniformly controlled everywhere. But, so right now it should be non-obvious that this is a better problem to consider than this. Right. Because if I consider that, I have this exact issue, I have to figure out how to parameterize this curve and then deal with an oscillatory interval. Okay. My curve is fixed and the function on the curve is a Gaussian. I can't get any better than that, really. And actually, the numerical method I'll describe in the end for this is actually what's used. This is just a reinterpretation of it as a riemann hilbert problem. Okay. Other questions? Okay. So we're going to put this on hold for a little bit. And then I'm going to go through Cauchy integrals and their computation, and then we'll eventually come back to maybe later in this lecture, uh, but probably not until tomorrow, actually, computing that or describing a method to compute it. So the data is, so this condition is part of the data, and then this condition is the other. So we have a boundary condition, so to speak, an asymptotic condition, and then a jump condition. And then these two statements, or really this statement, is a regularity statement, a statement in which sense the problem is solved. Right. Yeah. Right. So here, it's actually, once I say this, it's fairly clear it has to be unique from these two. Right. So if I had another solution, so if I had another solution that satisfies all those properties, phi, then you define, uh, let's call it um, kappa, which is psi minus phi. That function you can check will, of course, still satisfy this, will still have continuous boundary values, and will actually satisfy a zero jump condition. And then Louisville's theorem tells you that that has to be identically be zero, right? So this is actually critical in the statement of the problem to have uniqueness. And I'll give you an example later on of where if you don't state this, you have non-uniqueness. So this is critical. Okay. Let me erase this too. Okay, so now the main tool to actually solve this problem is going to be the Cauchy integral. And the solution actually turns out to be the Cauchy integral of this along the imaginary axis. But let's actually see why that's true. Right, so now about Cauchy integrals. And arguably, the fundamental mental object of study in 
complex analysis. This is really to fix notation. Analysis is the Cauchy integral, which I will use the notation C gamma of F, which is contour integral over a curve gamma, F of S, S minus Z dS, and I like this d bar notation where d bar of s is equal to ds over 2 pi i. This simplifies things. And this, of course, we want to think z in c take away gamma. Yes? It will so be finite for every finite z, right? We had, so the, the error function has this integral. It has a, has a minus, uh, not z, this should be s. This says positive, right. This decays on the imaginary axis. So maybe the better way is to just to go back here and look at this and see that this is actually capturing everything. Writing, keeping this here is capturing all the, like so this blows up on the imaginary axis, this decays, so I've captured it exactly by saying this goes as one over z. Right. And so that's the whole integration by parts calculation to see what your leading order term is. You have an exponential growth term and you exactly factor that off. I don't, I don't, I don't want to say that it's always true. I mean, for this one, for me, the reason why this is true, it's an artifact of just putting this two here. And I form a linear combination of the boundary values in such a way that I cancel out this. And that was my main goal in doing psi plus minus psi minus to cancel this term out. If, if I had different, if I had like a factor of a half here, then I would do like twice this one minus this one and I would, just so I can cancel out the error function. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't want to make any more general statement about, I mean, for these special function calculations, it's probably true where you have, as I mentioned, for the area function, you have some fractional, asymptotic growth or decay at infinity in terms of e to the minus z to the three halves. And then that appears in the jump. But I don't want to make more general statements. Okay. All right, so the first question is just a simple question, simple quote unquote, about the existence of this. When does this give us an analytic function off of gamma? Right. Function off of gamma. Right. So that's just an existence, you know, what conditions do I need on both gamma and the function to guarantee that I have a well-defined analytic function on the on C minus gamma, right? Because even I haven't put any hypotheses down, I don't even know that this is, uh, I don't even know that this is an open set. <laughs> I mean, so there's clearly some, some restrictions one has to put down. In the end, so I'm gonna talk about things initially very, in a very general setting. When I do computations, everything is piecewise affine. So I just have linear contours. Everything works out. Everything is super nice. But uh, I think it's, you know, it, these are the facts that when I was first looking at this material, I really wish were put in front of me. All 
All right. So, okay, let's make some assumptions on gamma. Gamma, which will take i to not to r to c. Here, this guy, which I assume is continuous. I'll say i is an interval. An interval. Um, and gamma should be one to one. Right here, gamma, this guy parameterizes the contour gamma. And so I'll try to stick to the following kind of notation, uh, this really language that an arc is a, is this? That's an arc. A, a curve is closed. I'm just kind of in, in the sense of, you know, Jordan curve theorem, I just like to use curve then. All right, so then it bends back on itself. So, okay, it's not one to one. Um, okay, if I is some closed interval, then it's not one to one at the endpoint. So you restrat, re, re, put in that condition at, for a curve. And then a contour is a finite union of curves and arcs. And I, this interval could be, of course, an unbounded thing. Okay, so the first, the first thing is, let's just rectify it, right? So that's the kind of the first minimum assumption we can put down on the curve is that it's rectifiable. Right, and so just to remind ourselves, um, right, so let me do a little bit, a little bit more. Um, let's do actually a side calculation here before we talk about exactly what that means. I skipped over some things. Um, for S1, S2 in gamma, we say, S1 is less than or equal to S2 if uh, gamma of T1 is equal to S1, gamma of T2 is equal to S2, and T1 is less than or equal to T2. Okay. And then, Here. So then gamma is locally rectifiable if for S1 less than or equal to S2, S1, S2 in gamma, the supremum over all partitions uh, right. we want I'll we'll use this notation x i minus gamma of x i minus one where p is a partition, so t one is equal to x zero uh, and then all the way up to t two is equal to x. So it's locally rectifiable if I just take any sub arc and that's rectifiable. Okay. 
And then, so this, of course, induces a natural arc length measure theory for the curve. And when you do your usual contour integral, you have your ds. And then out of this, this guy will be the arc length measure. Right. That's what I'll use for the absolute value of ds, which can be understood as a, vari as a total variation of something. Okay, so then what's our first fact about Cauchy integrals? Let me grab my eraser. Right, so here is a fact. So if gamma is closed, and in this case I mean as a set, let's say it's locally rectifiable. I also want to assume there exists A in C take away gamma such that, okay, if I integrate over gamma, the function is finite. Right, so this is basically a condition on the behavior of the contour at infinity. And I could do this with any p and do, uh, you know, one plus p, one over, one over p plus one over q is one, but I'm just going to stick with L2, simplify the answer. Okay, and f is in L2 of gamma, so a square integrable function on the curve with respect to arc length measure. Then c gamma f of z exists for all z and c take away gamma. And then furthermore, it is analytic. Right? And so how you do that is, okay, so you have your Cauchy integral, and then you use really Cauchy-Schwartz on the integrand, and then for a general z, you have to use this to basically look at s, s minus z over s minus a mod squared, which is a bounded function on the curve. And so you can change between any a and any z using that relationship. Okay, so I mean, this is all a bit esoteric because everything in the end is going to be a piecewise smooth curve, right? But, you know, for talking about, we'll end up talking about the L2 theory of Cauchy integrals and having this kind of measure theory, the arc length measure sitting around in the back of your mind is a, is a good thing. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so, well, in the end, we, we will deal with that specifically, but for this, to understand this, it's probably easiest to picture this as just an arc, as just a, a single curve that doesn't self-intersect. And then once I state the general results, it, that's true. Uh, that's true under any finite union of these curves. Okay. So now let's do a Cauchy integral calculation that's maybe a bit more concrete. So let's assume F is given by a Laurent series U.
in an open an open annulus A. All right, so picture is we have say this is the origin. I have my annulus A and have function F is given by our Laurent series, sum over all n, a n, z to the n. And this converges in this open n plus. And so let's maybe be a little bit more clear. Okay. So now let's take a curve. Take a curve, gamma, which is a, lies inside A. And let's compute the Cauchy integral of F along that curve. All right, so C gamma of F of Z, right? So it's a curve, meaning it comes back to itself. It's closed as a curve. And, right, so what is this? So it's going to be different based on whether z is inside the curve or outside the curve. And so if I'm inside the curve, right, so the Cauchy integral should give me an analytic function. And so if I'm going to get an analytic function inside the curve, I better not have any of my negative powers of z. Right, or you can use a residue theory. Right, and then outside you have to take orientation into account and you get outside Z, outside gamma. Okay. Okay, so now you've naturally defined a sectionally analytic function. So I have this, and suddenly this actually, even though my function initially only was analytic inside this annulus, I took the Cauchy integral of it, and then if I evaluate outside gamma, I get this analytic function, I evaluate inside gamma, I get this analytic function. Okay? So this is naturally how Cauchy integrals give you sectionally analytic functions, where they have some sort of behavior that's non-analytic across the contour of integration, but they're nicely behaved outside, away from the contour. Okay, so there's another fact that it's kind of fairly clear because of our assumptions on this being a Laurent series. So if I take S in the curve, or in gamma, and I define C plus gamma, this is the limit as Z goes to S, not infinity, as Z goes to S, Z staying inside, and I guess there's one thing that I should be doing that does affect everything, is make sure we have the orientation correct. Otherwise, everything would swap. Okay. All right, so if I define this to be the limit from the inside because we have a natural plus and minus from the induced orientation, so I can define this guy this limit z goes to s z outside c gamma f of z. Okay, so what's true? Right, so the main thing I want to 
is that these limits exist. I'll say the limits that and that exist and are continuous. Right? And continuous as functions of s on the curve. Right, so why do they exist? Well, it really just, I mean, there's a couple ways to think about it. It really just comes from Taylor series arguments. Right? If the series converges, then it has to be continuous inside the domain on which it converges. Well, it's much more than that, it's analytic. Okay, and then there's one more property that I want to highlight. Questions? All right, so then I want to consider C gamma plus F of S minus C gamma minus F of S. Right. Right. We, we saw a similar object in the Riemann-Hilbert problem I put up to start. And so what is that? And it follows just from this. So I take so my boundary value on the plus side is equal to this with z replaced with s. My boundary value on the minus side is equal to this with z replaced with s. So I take that minus that and I get just f of s. Right. So the important pieces are that we have boundary values, and once we have the boundary values, we have this relationship. And so if I want to construct a sectionally, I mean, this, there's a lot of assumptions here that we need to remove, but if I want to construct a sectionally analytic function under assuming that F satisfies these conditions, and I want to solve psi plus of s minus psi minus of s equals f of s, s in gamma, assuming f satisfies all those conditions, with the added condition that f decays at infinity, or is really order one over z at infinity. So if I want to solve that problem, we basically know that the unique solution has to be given by the Cauchy integral of f of z. Assuming F satisfies all these additional, prop additional conditions, which we will now start to peel away. Right. And so this is also, depending on who you ask, it might go under different names, but this is a common name that people use, Plumel dilemma. And it extends in great generality, not just to this nice, nice situation. So, questions? So my next task is to do exactly what I just said and start to relax the assumptions from this situation because that's certainly not general enough. I'm losing my eraser. So we will now discuss two classes of functions. And we always need to, and curves, but I'll try to, at least for the first class, hide the, any issues with curves. We'll just assume all of our issues away. Uh, 
classes of functions and curves for which call it star and two stars no. hold. Right, and so here is star, and then here is two stars. I want boundary values, and then once I have boundary values, I want to be able to reconstruct the function I'm integrating by taking the left boundary value minus the right. Okay, so class one, and so this is holder, continuous functions. And First note is this, the usual reference is this, musk hellish -Havili. 1953. And let me add an additional note here. Let's do smooth curves. Right, so when I say it's smooth, that means for me, that means the gamma that parameterized the curve is infinitely differentiable. Okay, and then it's curve, it's a curve, so it comes back on itself. And so, let's think. Okay, and so let's first remind ourselves what holder continuity is, and then I'll just give you uh, the actual, uh, like a heuristic calculation as to why it's true. So let gamma, be a bounded, bounded smooth curve. A function, f, which takes gamma to c, is, we'll just deal with uniformity. So uniformly, alpha holder. If, so this will be a semi-norm, this thing right here, which is you take the supremum of all S1, S2, and gamma, making sure that S1 is not equal to S2, evaluate F at S1 minus F at S2, this over S1 minus S2 to the alpha, this should be finite. Right, and then this is a semi-norm because the constant gives you zero. So if you take this norm plus, say, the uniform norm, then that gives you a actual norm on holder continuous functions. But we don't really need that. Because once we actually consider equations on spaces, we're going to deal with L2-based spaces and not holder spaces. Okay, so here is stated as a fact for holder continuous functions on smooth curves. So this should be Z as non tangential boundary values on gamma. Okay, and so what do I mean by non-tangential? So there's my curve. I need to first specify a cone. Here's my tangent. I have to specify a cone at my tangent and then say I take a limit to the curve, take a boundary value on the curve of my analytic function where I'm only allowed to stay within that cone. All right, so I can't do something like come in here and then do something tangential. To and you can do this for any angle, but this has to be fix an angle and then you take a limit within the cone. That's what non-tangential means. Okay. And C gamma plus minus, these are bounded linear operators. On the space of holder continuous functions. Of alpha holder 
continuous functions. Okay. And so that's the main fact, and I'll end my lecture today with just giving you a heuristic reason as to why it's true. So the big thing is um, right, and then this, this, and two stars. And, right, so here, this is basically one star, kind of written in a different way, and then there's two stars. Okay. So, so why, let's take Z inside gamma. and consider the Cauchy integral. So I will write it as a sum of two terms. And I'll integrate with respect to an S prime variable so that I can talk about a point S on the curve. All right, so I subtracted off of this and let's, this is ds prime over s prime minus, right? So I picked a point z inside, and then I took a point s on the curve, right? So that's this, it's not an integration variable. Okay, so this is a very nice thing to deal with. This s is just fixed. And so this is one if I'm inside, zero if I'm outside. Good. So I all, the whole analysis boils down to understanding this as z goes to s. But this guy vanishes when uh, right, s is s prime. So then the pole, so to speak, that I'm introducing on the curve as z goes to s is going to be canceled out appropriately with the numerator. And so let's just, so if I just look at this, f of s, right? Thinking about, I, did, I took the limit as z went to s. Let's first do a calculation. Well, this, this is less than some constant. The constant is coming from this. So maybe I'll put that in. Let's just say it's the. And S minus S prime to the one minus alpha. But that's integrable. Just because I have this alpha, and maybe I should have been a little bit more careful for this, you really want to take that. Right? So that's integrable. And what that actually means is this is effectively a continuous function at z equals s. So I can take the limit of this function from the inside and the outside at z equals s, and I get the same thing. Okay? So then the claim is that it still has to be checked, but that this is equal to ds prime, and then plus this integrates to one, so we get plus f of s. Right? If I can take the limit, this is always one, I take the limit, I still get one, Okay, then it remains to check that C gamma minus F of S is actually, well, if you believe that Plumel's lemma has to be true, it better just be this first term. Right? So then when I take C plus minus C minus, I just get F. Uh, 
Uh, I may have switched, actually I switched my primes over here. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that, that's roughly how the whole proof goes of this. You just have to work pretty hard to show that this limit actually is, exists and for non-tangential boundary values and all that. Um, so at the start of the next lecture, we'll talk about class two, which will be going back to when I first started to the L2 functions and do the L2 theory of boundary values, which I find to be more convenient to carry forward. I'll stop there.